Hello everyone oh and welcome to uh, Scuffed Foria. Um, now obviously I'm not a graphic designer, but I can be when I want to be in my spare time. And you can see it right behind me, right? Look at the absolute genius that is this design behind me. This is... I'm actually very impressed. It is episode 12 though, technically. But... Fuck, I can't change it. It's fine. It's, it's actually episode 1 of Scuffed Foria. Completely no relationship to Euphoria officially. No relationship Look, though, at all. All I know is that a lot of people wanted us to talk more about the finals weekend, which I think is fair because uh -huh. I, I can't be the only one that was caught completely off fucking guard by a G2 12 0. You know, Vitality. Yeah. Dude. I could believe Vitality. I could believe Vitality. I could believe Misfits. After that, it got it got fucking weird. G two winning, fine. G two three zero both times. That was that was some wacky shit. Dude, uh, fuck happened this weekend. What the hap What the fuck happened this last weekend? What happened to G two? Honestly, what happened I mean, to G two? Like, um, everyone played so fucking good uh, in every series. But I will say, Fnatic were absolutely broken. I think Fnatic were so mentally broken. It looked like like. Yeah, the fact yeah. that game one was like 28 minutes, game two was like 30, like only competitive game was game three maybe, but I even think that uh, Fnatic should have won game three, but they still choked it a bit and Jankos did smurf it. Yeah, I agree. I think that the Odo's Civil War comments about playoff continues to be like one of my favorite pro player things that we've talked about ever because it just mm. feels like it keeps coming up, it keeps being relevant, and Fnatic... And I don't know shit for the record. I, I like avoid asking those questions because um, I don't want to like have secret information because it makes it harder to talk about stuff. Yeah. Fanatic to me look like there's some shit going on behind the scenes. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't know what it is what? though because I watched I watched their um, their behind the scenes video against G two and even after game two they were saying like. Yeah, it's fine, guys. We can still make this a long series. We're playing good. We just need to make sure the early game is stable. And then we'll, like, you know, they're really, they're really like, tryharding. But Flack had said in his interview after, after they won, he said, like, um, yeah, there was an absolute mental diff between the teams. When we would finish one game on stage, we'd all go off stage together as a, as a unit, as an army. And on their team, one would go to the bathroom, one would go outside, one would sit on the, uh, the fucking stage for a while. The other would be, I don't know, you know, like, the the G two thing where they all come on stage together at the same time and they all go off stage together at the same time was like I think that's mental diff, no joke. They should the teams should do that more. Yeah. I mean I, I completely agree. And I, I think that G two not only seem to have the best uh team environment, which is a big statement because I think Rogue are also known to have like Trimby and Odo have nothing had nothing but good things to say about their team environment, right? Mm. But um also as a complete aside, G two's drafting through all of playoffs uh is like i think rogues drafting is the only team that, that even had comparable drafting right up until the finals i feel like dylan falco is like the one coach that the, even the public can 100 percent see that man is earning his paycheck you know what i mean like the four answers to leblanc even if, if they didn't work if you really just outplayed them instantly into like eight million comps he got broken blade to play three fucking orn games back to back because he recognized in that four. first Fnatic series that four, um, he recognized in that first Fnatic series that they needed to play a composition that like brought Flacket more into the team, and you can't really do that when you're playing these split pushing side laners, right? And I don't know. Obviously, that could be a Dylan thing. That could be Rodrigo, their head analyst. That could be a team wide thing. But like G two feel like the team that like recognized what went wrong in that first series and then just fucking like adapted and ran Dude, with it. G two. I think we were talking about this on like one of the episodes, like meta reads, G2's meta read is absolutely on fucking point, you know? Yeah. They're playing Jarv and Orn every game and they will play uh, Ari as well if it's open. That's it. That's their formula. And if, if those champs aren't open, they'll plug and play. But luckily one was always open. They always had either Jarvan or Zaya or Ari or Orn and this was just the comp they always draft. And I don't know if you watched EU Masters last night. Mm -hmm. but eu masters last night every single team was like first rotating orn first picking orn or first picking jarvan first dating jarvan same thing with ari like g2's meta read throughout the whole lower bracket run was so perfect that literally every team in europe right now is just copying exactly what they're doing and i feel like teams in the in the finals weekend were just so dizzy like 
Fennec still were convinced that TF's useful and Kai'Sa mid is a thing, you know. Yeah. Um, Rogue also, was still like, convinced like Jace, TF, Azir, Gwen were still useful champs. They had their, their Rumble uh, Lucian, which they I, played like in week seven or something. I, I feel like Rogue were a little dizzy because I actually thought Rogue were ahead of the curve when Maorang was just playing Maorang champs and everyone else was adapting to him, you know, when it was just like Volibear, J4, basically Hecarim, you know what I mean? And obviously, like, Viego showed up, Lee Sin showed up, even though their win rates were abysmal. But, like, mm -hmm. I thought that they were going to be the ones that were ahead of curve for most of the playoffs. But then when they got... The further we got, the weirder the shit that they were drafting got. And that Gwen pick, like, I think that has to be universally considered. Like, I know they kind of drafted themselves into a corner and they needed something like that in the top lane. But, my God, that champion looks fucking useless. I don't they know literally are they comp they're, they're literally buffing her. Like that's how you know you picked a dog shit champion is that when you when two patches from now she's being buffed because she's so bad. When she was like a super huge pro play problem. So I, I can't fault it. Maybe Odo <clears> felt <throat> like it was still the best pick there, but like Ro Rogue were ended up being the team that looked dizzy in draft, I think, at the end of the day, which was really weird because it felt like they were so coming out of that Fnatic series, they were super grounded. They kind of adapted mm. on the fly. They got Trimby on the Recon. It felt like they had recognized what was gone wrong, you know, and they were going to come back and they were going to be fucking super dominant opponent for G2 in the finals. But mm -hmm. nah, bro, they just, they got Ari Jarvan just over and over. You know, you got these Orn every game, which to be fair, if you're not ready for it, I can see how it's really annoying, how you're convinced that all of your fucking top lane picks are going to be fine into Orn. Because yeah, it's yeah, one yeah. of those champions that's, you, I mean, you're playing Orn now, right? Like, you know, Dude, this champion is, like, my Orn is nuts. nuts so My Orn is absolutely crazy. You can ask my Twitch chat. They know it's on another level. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm, I'm smurfing my way all the way to Challenger by just grinding Orn. It's unbelievable. Like, after one single game, my mechanics are ridiculous. My TP flanks are... Uh, they're constructed alternatively, I have to say. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I think... Uh, I think Orn is the most problematic tank to ever exist in League of Legends. Now, I say that with, take out the pinch of salt, because if everyone could play Scion, like the boss plays the Scion, I think that like the solo key ladder would be absolutely ruined by Scion. Can you imagine but if the there was like that, 10 bounces on the ladder? Oh my god. No. I can't, like, oh my, watching solo key would be so boring. It would just literally be Scion and Scion counters top lane, and that would that would exactly be it. So fucking but the funny. big, the here's the thing, dude, is it's like, Every tank in the game has to go in to get their shit off. You know, their engages, whatever the hell. Blow you know, their they load. put themselves at risk. Yeah. Orn gets to sit a mile back and blow the horn. Is it good? Is it bad? He can just fucking decide from fucking downtown. You know, he's, he's a top laner with like, it's not a semi-global, but a long ass range ultimate, you know. And then on top of that, he's got the unstoppableness and like, yeah, there's going to be situations where Malphite is just strictly a better tank. There's going to be situations where, like, Scion is a better tank if we ever go back to lane swaps or whatever. But it just feels to me like this champion is, like, will and probably will always be, as long as his numbers are decent, like, the king of tank top laners because he just does uh, his damage is so nuts. much. Yeah, his well, damage is nuts. He scales with armor and MR. The base damage is super high. Like, the combos are... I mean, I've watched... I've seen some of the combos. They're not, like, easy, but they mm. are super, super powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's broken as fuck. Also, I think there's like, I think there's like a problem right now in League with tank items where like, mm -hmm. tank items for top laners, I've noticed ever since I played top lane are pretty easy. You know, you go Iceborne or Sunfire or something, uh, Frostfire yeah. or Sunfire or something, Force of Nature, Frozen Heart, Happy Days. But for jungle, it feels really awkward because, um, I don't know, when I watch Jarvans normally, they go their mythic, like chem tank, and then they have to build Zonia mm -hmm. second or Anathema sec second or something. That's literally the tank items. And once you have Anathema, Zonia, chem tank, that's it. That's your full build for the rest of the game because you don't get any more resources. I don't know, tank items to me feel off when Zonia is like the highest prio item for them. Like Volibear I mean, builds it, uh, Jarvan builds it. We've talked about it. I think Zonia's is fundamentally like the most ridiculous item in League of Legends. It's so disgusting how powerful that active is but yeah. i i agree i think that like the big thing for orn right and why he can build whatever the fuck he wants is obviously he gets more resources because he has a solo lane to farm mm. um he's got ornaments which are obviously super strong too oh, and he's go. got really good scaling with his armor and mr where it's like volibear jarvan oh, champ. are like maybe not even they're not even really supposed to be like tanky frontliners like they can be they're, they're supposed to be this like bruisery thing volibear's supposed to be this early game like mm. i the chem tank is great you know what i mean and i but i think that it's like People like the kits aren't really designed to support their identity as being pure tanks. Like Scion W is such a stupid ability. You get so much again, watching too much Bios, but shout out to the Bios. But uh 
you know, you get so Perks much health from that. Orn, you get so much um, bonus stats, just the extra bonus stats for, for the ornaments and the percentage extra bonus stats that you get. Scion, the, the armor multipliers, like tanks feel so good when building tank items. But yeah. when you try to force tank on like J4 or, or Volibear, like it's still good because the champion's kits are so strong. But like you're getting fucked. Like, they, are you kidding me? The AP from Zanyas is like, is that really going to feel like a good investment? Maybe if you're wildly ahead, it will. But there's yeah, obviously yeah. going to be a better, better item for a bruisery thing. It's just in competitive, the most valuable thing you can do is jump in, burn all your spells, and not die for an extra 2.5 yeah, seconds. Yeah, which yeah. probably says more about jungle roll than it does about tank items, I think. It's kind of sad that that's like what jungle roll has been reduced to. I think it's super fun to watch. I would rather watch early game ganking junglers than another like Canyon Nidalee farm fest, even though, yeah, Canyon's obviously a god. Uh, but it's... Yeah. It's rough, I think dude. I think a balance is always good as well. Like not too much of one thing. Like a balance of this, a balance of that. I want to see I want to see I want to see Canyon blasting peanuts buoy hole, like one game, and the next game yeah. I want to watch a Jarvan do some early ganks. You know, um, I don't know. Meta's a weird one because like, um, there's new patches coming out already, and I think the biggest example of like EU getting fucked by a patch is 2020, 2020 worlds where. Like Summer Split was, I remember I was playing jungle in 2020. Summer Split, Summer Split meta was oh, set, yeah. set Trundle, Sejuani, Gregas, Karthus, things but, like this. And then the meta shifts, and all of a sudden it's Lilia, Nidalee, and uh, then EU has to go to Worlds on carry junglers with like one month practice. And uh, I, that, that's I what agree. We, we got fucked with. But it's also, I think, important to remember that like the meta had probably been those champions for a long time and we were slow so slow to adapt because i remember G, uh, yankos in that playoffs being like fuck it you know like i'm just gonna play i think it was set that he brought the set back out when like no one was playing set you know what i mean and it worked for g2 but it, that was just a thing where like our best junglers were not the best on those champions or our best jungler maybe at the time mm -hmm. was yankos and i think it was an inspire too who was more willing to play the nidalee but also just like it's. I think it is always going to be very, very bad for EU when it's like farming jungle meta. I think that shit is so, so hard to play. And I think that like, I I don't know, dude. I don't know if our junglers can no, do it. But, I'll be honest. Yeah, it's 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 one of those things where like I think I, I spoke to so many AD carries in Europe about this where like playing range supports in EU, it it's impossible. You can't do it. Like you need so many yeah. things to go right. You need your mid to have an early pick that can hover bot side in a jungle that can full clear fast like Nidalee and B bots first or sack camps and B bots first. You need you need Gumiushi Carrier as your nameplates in bot lane to win every trade and stack ways properly. And then you need to get your fifty CS lead minimum, otherwise you're useless, right? And when you play mm -hmm. like Kate Karma in EU or your Estro Karma, they just die to level two ganks and the game's over. Um yeah. But if you, like, I remember I was talking to teams in scrims last year in Worlds, like, you can't give T1 Caitlyn Lux, you can't give T1 Estro Karma, otherwise bot is just over at level 5 and you've already lost the game on your tower. Um, and that's where, like, farming junglers come in, because if you watch yeah. um, T1, what they often do is, like, I think last year Ono would just pick Nidalee and they would play Caitlyn Lux or something, and uh, yeah, they have the fastest farming jungler in the game with the hardest pushing bot, and you can't do shit against it unless you find kills. Yeah, I think that it's all we're always I think it's probably probably forever we should be ready for EU to be on the back foot internationally and any in any western region whether that's LEC or LCS actually. Mm. Um for a number of reasons, you know. But I think one of them is is going to be at least in the short term and who knows this could change in the future is like we it always feels like we need the meta to be in our favor to really compete at the highest level. Like, when G2 won MSI, they were the meta. You know what I mean? And, like, obviously, they were also an incredible fucking team. I'm not trying to take anything away from that achievement. But, like, we saw what happened in 2020 Worlds when, like, the meta wasn't super in our favor. It was infinitely harder, even with our all-star, you know, super team. And I think that my fear is that we, that the Asian teams, especially at MSI, bust out a lot more range bot laners and like our our players can't compete because we saw like rogue was really trying to force some of that and then it was trim me back to rakan you know and i think like engaged supports have always just been king in europe and probably always will be god bless i hate watching range supports but mm. i sweat like you talked to me about a caitlin lux from an lck team or that karma as really talking about and i'm like fuck yeah, it's this, uh, this is gonna be rough. Like we're either gonna break it or we're gonna watch our team lose so slowly it's gonna be agonizing. Yeah, and if you watch T one Gen G series, um the draft is like one team has to ban Karma, one team has to ban Kate because like 
it's basically if I ban Karma, I want to first pick Kate, so you have to ban Kate. And if I ban Kate, <clears throat> you have to ban Karma because I want to first pick Karma. That's how LCK bot lane drafts work. So these two champs are always yeah. banned on either side, on blue or red side. But in EU, that's not the case. So I feel like when you go up against T1 and MSI or something, and Kate Karma is still powerful, EU teams will have to ban both. They'll have to ban both Kate and Karma on red side, no matter what. So I think blue side for EU teams is probably good against T1 because otherwise um, you, you have a little bit more room to work with where if target bans on blue side are a bit easier because red side normally means you're locked into bans. For example, this year it's Seri. Um, and yeah, if you can't play Karma Estriel, then you have to ban Kate. And if you can't play Kate, you have to ban Karma Estriel, right? So it's really like a catch-22 of two bans that have to happen. Yeah, I wonder if we're on, I think, is it 12.7's new patch or 12.6? I don't know what we're on. For MSI, have you seen? I'm, I'm asking you. I don't know, I know actually. I person who knows, but I that's, saw that's going to be a huge sighting. I I saw their Swain and Olaf reworks. I don't know if that, that for sure won't be in. There's no way they wouldn't I, do that. There's no there's no way, right? I don't know. I yeah, saw usually if a Olaf champion reworks. is reworked during playoffs, right before playoffs, usually for international events, and this is a usually thing, they can always change it. So don't 100 percent quote me on this. But if, yeah. if a champion is not out and in pro play when playoff starts very rarely they'll enable him for worlds that's why we had to wait so long for like yone that world where he was like disabled for playoffs but then had been out for like three months we just didn't get to see him at worlds oh yeah um because they don't they're really i think they're really afraid of having another 2015 where they're just like have an entirely new fucking class of champions surprise skarner's good now darius is darius mordekaiser balanced mordekaiser bot like have fun kids Knock yourself out. Just, just blow the fucking yeah, blow the fucking meta out the water out of nowhere. Also, yeah. I did a tweet last night where I said, um, I think the team who wins MSI should lock a spot at Worlds. Now, um, I didn't go into too much context because it's something that I thought about, and I think the more you think mm -hmm. about it, the more it makes sense. Because the first reaction you're gonna have if I say that is, well, what if the team sucks in summer, right? They finish seventh place, let's say an LPL team wins. They finish seventh place in the LPL, and now this team is somehow locked into the World Championship, right? Now, yeah. the counter argument is the team that wins MSI has the longest schedule of the entire year. Because if you win spring, win MSI, uh, let's say you make summer playoffs as well, and then go to Worlds, uh, like RNG did last year, they have the longest schedule of anyone. They don't have, I think they have a two week break turnaround from uh, the end of MSI to the start of the summer playoffs, right? Um, but what actually happened to RNG last year is if you watch their LPL summer run, the first four weeks of summer split, they lost almost every game. They came into summer and they were like one and seven. And they just yeah. scraped Worlds because they made a miracle run back. Now, why were they struggling in the early stages of summer? Because, well, they had to adapt to a brand new meta because they were playing on a different patch for MSI. And they had no break. And all the other teams were scrimming on that exact patch that they were not scrimming on because they were at MSI. So when they came back, they were already behind, right? Um, mm -hmm. so it puts you on the back foot for summer which makes worlds even harder to reach and if you're if you're winning MSI which is all the first seeds of every region you're obviously a talented team like I don't give a fuck what the meta is like you're five yeah. players who are insanely good because you beat everyone of every region who won spring so I think what it does is it gives like a cushion to the team where they don't have to worry too much about making worlds and keep sweating for the entire summer split but also it gives them time to maybe take a break or like relax a bit and not overstress for the entire year where they know they're going to make worlds. If they bomb out of playoffs in like fourth place, fifth place, it's okay. It gives them more time to take a break or practice a bit more, I think. Yeah. Uh, so conceptually, I think I disagree at the scale that you're thinking. Like, I don't think it should be like free worlds, but I agree that the teams that win MSI or even go far at MSI, maybe as much as top four, maybe just top two, should be rewarded in some capacity domestically. Because mm. not only do I agree that MSI is super, super draining, but um, it is also a massive competitive disadvantage for summer. And I think most teams ultimately yeah. don't complain about it because the experience that they gain at MSI is good. And obviously, if you're winning MSI, like, what the fuck do you care? Like, the MSI is way bigger deal than an another domestic season. But I do think that, like, I think they should be rewarded domestically. Oh, and chemist. I guess the simplest way... Ooh. Oh, there you go. Am I good? All right, yeah. I don't know. New setup. Um, I think they should be rewarded domestically. And I think that ultimately, championship points is probably the easiest way. Uh, for us in EU, that would mean higher playoff seeding slash more likely to get into playoffs. 
Um, for other regions, it would mean higher placing or basically almost guaranteed placing in the gauntlet, probably. Mm -hmm. um, for the regions to still do the the kind of world's qualifying gauntlet. Because I, I agree. I think something should be there. I think auto qualifying is rough because like nothing says that you can't win MSI and then the team collapses and they like bench a couple people, right? Like let's say G2 2016 spring, they went to MSI. That was the vacation meme. Let's say they had made top four and then Carlos had benched their bot lane and brought in Sven and Mithy and we'd auto qualified that team to Worlds. Now that team ended up being good, so that's not the best example. But if that team had just fucking sucked, they would have had an auto world slot. And similarly, mm. if I'm G2... You know what I mean? And I'm auto-qualified for Worlds. I'm like, damn. Okay. I'm going to send all of my players to Korea for the first half of the split, and they're just going to boot camp, and I'm going to put five randoms on stage. Like, you over there in HR, what's your rank? Oh, pff, you're D2? Like, come on, come on, come play on stage. Because it just doesn't matter, right? The only mm -hmm. thing you want is the best possible practice, which we know, because where people choose to boot camp isn't always going to be domestically in EU. So I think it's potentially exploitable i think it's yeah it's, but it's, yeah at its best it's good i agree with you at its best it's it's really good it's really good but at its mm. worst it's also really bad that's the problem yeah i mean i see what you're saying about boot camping and like fucking over the early stages of you're talking about early stages of summer right because you're locked at worlds yeah because you're locked at worlds so just fuck fuck around you yeah. could also like fuck the end of spring playoffs right because spring is useless and then go boot camp and like let the other teams go to msi and take yourself like five weeks before before summer to like get better right and like take oh, yeah. spring yeah. really easy because worlds is 10 times more important right so you can do both sides of that and also g2 like i remember even g2 did this right where they the first two weeks of summer they had to sub in like uh who yeah, was playing like Werelib, Lulex. There was like random people playing for G2 one for of the, the first. Was it the Korean mid laner from one of the LFL teams? What was his name? I forget. Anyway, yeah, anyway, people yeah, were playing in about, G2 yeah. because they needed a break, right? And that's a good another mm -hmm. good Western example uh, where you're basically sacking the first two or three weeks of summer just because you're so burnt from MSI. Um, and I feel like MSI is it's nice to win MSI, but everyone will always remember the world's winner, and Worlds is always going to be the bigger sure. tournament. So I feel like teams invest, they have to invest so much time in spring, spring playoffs, MSI, summer, summer playoffs into Worlds. By the time they get to Worlds, it's like, if you've been through that entire schedule, you're already at a disadvantage. Um, mm -hmm. And you never really get a break, ever. Um, and having that like guaranteed spot at Worlds allows you to be a bit more, a bit less stressed. Because imagine the mental, thought, the mental side of like being a player where you just won MSI, you're like fifth in playoffs regular season because you came off to a rocky start. And now you're in a summer playoffs where you can face like not making worlds, you know, uh, yeah. and you're already so exhausted. Um, I, I feel like it uh, maybe guaranteeing a spot is too far, I mean, but something to help them because spring just feels so useless um, right now because I mean, it's all the build up to worlds. Yeah. I think the struggle, there's like a couple struggles. And I think one of them is obviously like really wanting to make sure that we get the best teams to Worlds and and being aware that because the competitive calendar is so dense that like teams who do have to go to Worlds and MSI, whether it's the G2s of years past or Mad Lions, you know, whatever our, uh, you know, current top team is, those teams really suffer. And Mac was one of the first guys who like really came out and talked about it very openly. And we know, and from talking to G2 behind the scenes, I know they also struggled with it. Like they were fucking done so, so many times, but because like they were all such competitive people and the team environment was good, it was, it, it was, they were able to keep going. So it's, yeah, it's like, I agree that they should be rewarded because I don't see a world where the competitive calendar gets less dense. I think it's probably going to stay this way. I don't mm. really know. It's not my department. I don't make those kind of decisions, but, um, I, I, yeah, I'm on the same page with you. you I know, think maybe not auto qualification, but some sort of reward domestically or some sort of scheduling shift that means that they play less in the early season. And again, these things are really complicated technically. So I wouldn't, I don't want to set the expectation that anything are going to happen, but I do think that it would be, it would be cool to get some sort of reward that reduces the pressure on teams who do well internationally mm. uh, at MSI. Yeah. Do you know, I had a dream last night. I dreamt that there was five groups at Worlds and Worlds was like an extra three weeks long. And there was group Damn. E where teams all had like LP and LSK had five seeds and EU and NA had like four seeds. And um, like there was group E, but then I was like in my dream after the group stage finished, I had to be the one to organize like the, the knockout stage, but I couldn't figure it out because there's five groups. And if you all go to a quarterfinals uh -huh. with 10 teams, 
Um, you can do the quarterfinals, but then you have five teams for semis, which doesn't make sense. So I could never really wrap my head around how I was going to do the knockout stage. And then I woke up. Okay, well, I'm just going to type in 10 team bracket and we're going to see what it looks like. 10 team single, let's do 10 team double elimination bracket. Oh, Ooh, are we getting too bold? Double elimination? Yeah, in my dream, I was are also thinking Dota of now? like, if all 10 teams, uh, top two of each group, 10 teams, you go into another group stage. But then I thought that's too boring. Oh, okay. Okay. Actual, actual pitch, regardless okay. of how many groups, five, six, eight, 17, two, um, first seeds play against first seeds in the upper bracket. Second okay. seeds play against second seeds in the lower bracket. There's still how five teams for each, no? Yeah. Well, sure. There can be five. Uh, I mean, okay. That's in your, your bracket world. <laughs> yeah. yeah <laughs> Maybe. Maybe there's, I don't know, maybe one of the groups is considered shittier. So like the first and second have to play each other or better. Like first that, and yeah. second have to play each other. I don't know. Maybe there's like a tiebreaker for second seeds and one of the teams gets, I don't know, knocked down or some shit. But let's say mm. four groups for now for simplicity's sake, because you're right. Five doesn't work. First seeds versus first seeds. You know what I mean? And then yeah. second seeds versus second seeds in the lower bracket. So mm -hmm. groups is like infinitely more important because if you get first like first really really matters rather mm -hmm. than it being just like trying to duck a shit matchup and then also you get to watch all the first seed teams fight each other in the first round of quarterfinals how banger is that that's what i want that's pretty banger yeah that said that's it would just banger. literally be so many lck versus lpl best of five it would, it would be the it asia games so asia I, games with worlds I, I don't know if um Double elimination raises our chances or lowers our chances at winning a world championship. Uh, like no, we, kill, just... we kill, we kill, we killed Dan one once. Are we really gonna do it again? You know what I mean? Yeah, we have to kill them a few times. Well, yeah. if there was five teams, we'd have to. Yeah, no, I think that would reduce the West's chances of winning worlds. But I do hope there is an elimination bracket this year for worlds. I don't know if there is, but there's been so much talk about it last year, where like no. G two is a good example of why a lower bracket is good. Like we just saw it in Europe. If yep. there was no lower bracket in the LEC playoffs right now, the finals would be basically Rogue versus Fnatic. Yeah. And, and I think uh, the big yeah. the big thing about what a split bracket can do, like having a loser's bracket and a winner's bracket, is one, it creates incredible fucking stories. Like imagine T1 suck in groups, they barely make second, but then they like five game series all the way to world finals. You know, they fight tooth and nail because like maybe it's all the LPL teams are just slightly better. But then it's the story of the LCK just like through the losers bracket, every single elimination match just barely overcoming until they win worlds. Like that's a fucking fantastic story. Yeah. And on top of that, it lets you make groups be um, more impactful or allows you to do more with seeding in groups. You could even qualify more teams into a double bracket final. Like you could start putting third seeds in if you want more like EUNA representation. Sorry, mm -hmm. EUNA. Um, there's a lot you can do. The downside is like, the thing I'll say about formats is that everyone, when they think about formats, usually thinks from one perspective. For me and for most fans, it's like, we're always just like, what is the coolest slash best thing we can do for competitive? But also remember there's, business there's broadcast days there's cost so as much as i love this idea just remember that don't, before you go flaming the people who make formats like remember that they don't just get to do what we get to do this is for chat not for you Kato. we've had this discussion uh, yeah. they don't just get to do what we get to do and dream up like our favorite dream format they have to look at every single thing and it is more complicated than just that sounds fucking cool let's mm. do that do you want to hear my final pitch <clears throat> we're talking about sure. formats and stuff this is my final pitch i think maybe i've told you before okay this is what i think league of legends could look like in five years time okay what you do is for summer you um for summer basically what happens is there's no playoffs in europe or na there's no playoffs but mm -hmm. the top five teams from eu and the top five teams from na in the regular season they come together and it's called the Battle of the West. And you yep. do a massive knockout stage between the top five from EU and the top five from NA. And the top six of those top 10 go to Worlds. And the winner is the, 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 the winner of the West or something, right? The, the number one seed from the West because the West is united. The Western Games or something. Ooh. Um, ooh. Ooh, so like not it. only does it make it so you get some early NA versus EU spice, <laughs> but also... <laughs> Also, <laughs> yeah. also, you uh, you make it so the fan bases join together because G. Let's sure. say G two win, right? G two win the Battle of the West. 
they go to Worlds yeah. as the there was the West's first seed. Now NA can support that team because they are the mm. Western champions, not the NA champions, right? So the fan bases of EU and NA come together in harmony, and we we join forces as one to take like down it. the East. Yeah. Oh my God. I I mean I like it personally, but I think that uh, NA might have a problem when like FlyQuest and you know never gets to play at Worlds again, and it's just Team Liquid and five LEC teams. But I like it. <laughs> Actually, Odo I just like made a good lot. point. He would just go, I'll just go to NA and cash in my million and be an EU boy. Yeah, true. Actually, oh, NA, yeah. Would, NA would get all the players because if it's Battle of the West to Worlds, then it's probably better to get paid more while going to Worlds than get true. paid less. Wait, yeah. do we want to impromptu talk to Odo about finals? Odo, do you hey. want to talk about finals? You're, Odo, you're, you if, you're, if you're like traumatized, you cannot come and talk about finals. That's perfectly cool, my dude. But I'm curious because I would love to talk to you about it. If, if you want, no pressure. Oh, um, Carnival no Phantasm gifted 10 subs. Crazy. Much love, buddy. Yeah, Clueless. Okay. Let me, uh, let me add Odo to the call. Wait, I'm going to get rid of your camera because it's going to scuff. Yeah, the yeah, whole yeah. It's, scene. It's, it's all good. No, you're still there. Don't worry. Uh, I removed the camera, but you're still there. Uh, Look, it's me. It's my still Odo. face. Because I have a theory. Like, Why there's a lot of arguments best of one versus best of three. Best of three. Cool. Best of one. Infinitely better for viewership. Turns out viewership's important um, based on our experience in 2016, 2017. But I think the one team that would be way, way better in best of three with best of three in the regular season is Rogue. They might not finish first in the regular season, but I think it would make their performance in best of fives a little bit better. Just a wee bit. Just Wait, to, I think it would be a little easier. Except accept my friend request, but you did. There we go. Oh, shit, I just tabbed into Elden Ring. Wait, uh, hello. Am I live? Do you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, dude. How are you doing? Nice. I'm enjoying my life to the fullest. Yeah, and you're in your sudden uh, newfound free time. Swim. Yeah. You're famous. Bro, there's, there's just way too much free time. Fuck this. <laughs> <laughs> I love the scuffed. Webcam casual. Wait, that's um, an episode we're all here together. That's all good. Okay, Odo, I how much how much have you talked about that? Have you done any interviews about like what happened in finals and shit? Like do you want what's your side of what happened in finals from your side of the story, I guess? Let's I give mean, you we, the story. We didn't do any interviews. Wait, should I turn my webcam on or what? What am I supposed to you do? You can't you can if you want. You're the I, it's just your you face can, right you now. Mark, Mark right is doing over the fuck the with your face. <laughs> oh fuck man, I didn't make my bed okay. We're gonna we're staying scuffed, we're staying scuffed. That's okay. fine, bro. That's what this is for. Scuff for you. This is Pedro production, baby. <laughs> All right. Uh, but no, I didn't talk. Uh, I mean, uh, after the finals, I was like, nah, bro, just fuck this. I don't want to do any interviews. Yeah, that's why I, I was like, I was kind of surprised when you said yes, bro. Like, this is like, at this point, it's fucking traumatic, dude. You've been like, oh. Well, I mean, at this point, I'm I'm used to it. <laughs> yeah. Is that a, is that a, is that a yeah. laughing? Is that the laughing face with that's like the, the crying sad behind? Laugh. It's it's like I'm dead inside, but I I'm past the point of caring that I will just fuck it, talk about it. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Because so, so last we know last playoffs or last couple playoffs maybe were Civil War, and I was I, I'm I'm I was very empathetic for your team because I feel like I watched that piece where you're like Trimby's a good man. I want to win for Trimby because he's good people, and Trimby's like I want to win for Odo because he hasn't won yet. And it was like I was like oh, I was like pulling that, my heartstrings. That, I will say that was. So, that was probably one of the best pieces of content I've ever seen. Yeah. Fucking uh, it was banger. It was banger. Um so we know it wasn't Civil War. So what what happened? We have some questions about the Gwen pick, but let's start with generally like what's your <laughs> what, what happened from your perspective? Like what what went wrong? Is this like a you guys weren't performing on the day? Is this like G2 were super cracked and there's nothing you could do? What what actually give us the breakdown? Um I don't know, like, I, I feel like the way we lost, or, like, the reason we lost is kind of, like, insightful for, for like, Summer. I mean, that's a, that, that, that's a fuck ton of copium, but uh, sure. uh, I, I kind of believe that because, I, I, I don't know, like, I felt like we got draft defeat three games in a row, and in a way, it felt like we figured out that coming into playoffs, we got, like, a recipe for success with, like, our, our mm -hmm. meta read and stuff. And we were like, holy shit, everything's going well. Our meta is so, so good and all of this stuff. And then 
I, I guess after we reversed the Fnatic, we were kind of like on 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 the hype train. Uh, that yeah. were like uh, our meta read was good and stuff. And honestly, like even the scrims before finals, like you know, we got to scrim Fnatic and G2 because it's literally the only teams you have to scrim left. Yeah. And I mean, it looked fine. Um, most of the games were like maybe 50, 60 percent win rate, and we were like, okay, there were no like alarm bells ringing, you know, on like the, mm-hmm. in terms of like meta read and stuff. And I don't know I, I I just felt like G2's meta read was, was really really good after they lost against like Fnatic and they got knocked into lower bracket. I felt like um, we did not. I mean I mean for us going into like finals for us our failures was still like top prior for like mm-hmm. in terms of ADC. We felt like most of the meta relies on you know uh, our failures. Cash just didn't pick Ari in screens. Shut the fuck up. The, he, he still picked it. Like we knew about Ari and stuff, but I, I I don't know. It was just more like we still considered Aphelios as being the the best pick in the meta, and mm-hmm. we were wrong. And I feel like we 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 kind of fell into a trap where we were just kind of drafting good champs for us and for like our meta read, but we we honestly just didn't play to counter enemy comp a, at all. And mm. I feel like yeah, our meta read was good and stuff. But they were just a fucking Zaya running around that you, you couldn't do anything to it. You can't go dive boat, you can't do anything. The objective setups are, are far because she just queues and E's and does this 24 7. And I, I feel like we just tunneled so hard on our own like uh, meta or stuff that we kind of forgot to counter the enemy, a, enemy comp, you know? Because we are getting good champions into enemy champions, but our comp did not counter their comp. I mm-hmm. felt like, and I don't know, it was maybe just something that we overlooked, you know, because I felt like, um, I, I don't know, like, like season, season was long, and I felt like we were kind of like on top of our game for like the, the whole season, yeah. and it, this was just one of those things that you overlook because you're just tunneling so hard on the things that made you good so far, and I don't know, we just fucking dropped the ball massively in finals, and, and it sucks, you know, but... Um, I don't know it, it, it's a lot of copium, but I feel like this is one of those things that now there's always a an alarm bell in your head uh, ringing that this shit cannot happen again. Mm. So, so you guys wait. You guys were screaming. Um, you guys were screaming G two and Fnatic, uh, yeah, and Fnatic, and you. Yeah. I don't need to leak anything here, but when you were screaming them, they were playing things that they were playing on stage, and you didn't think it was a problem at the time. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I don't okay. think. I mean, we obviously when you, I, I think everyone was going into that week being like, yeah, just try to not show much because you're gonna end up facing each other anyway. So yeah, it, it was yeah. one of those things where people try to do it, but in the end, everyone just fucking try harding in scrims. And yeah. I don't know, like drafts were similar. I feel like maybe maybe some of the picks were like uh, a bit different. But I felt like Zaya and Ari was like present a lot, you know. But yeah. Yeah. I don't know, like in screens it was like fine, uh, I guess. But mm, I don't know. I feel like mm, I met up, met up from screens to stage on on that finals week. Didn't really change much. I I just think that our final draft was just like our our final prep for the draft in finals was kind of bad. So you're like, oh wow, we've learned our lesson, Copium. What the fuck do you do next time? Like, what, what, what is it? What actually like changes? And I, don't, you don't give me as much information as you're willing to give without like giving away the rogue secret sauce. But it's just this like just a situation where it's like if you had just thought more about it, looked at the meta more closely, even though you guys were winning and doing well, you would have had like better answers prepared. Like, if you could go back in time, what would you actually have like? What actions would you have taken differently other than like having the foresight to know that like Ari Jarvin was going to be a problem or Zaya was going to be a problem? Like, what actually changes next season? So this isn't just copium, but like an actual, I don't know, plan of action. Um, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't say that we were like cocky or anything, because um, at the end of the day, it's still like we were kind of underdogs for like the whole season. But I don't know. I did feel like we got maybe uh, a, a bit overconfident from Fnatic, and I don't know. I, I think just uh, just this whole concept of uh, countering enemy comp and not looking just like as, mm. at matchups individually is something that we did not really like. Uh, how to say? Pay attention to a lot, a lot this split, and uh, it was maybe one of the massive like oversights that we 
that we had. And I feel like that's maybe one of the things that uh, we can do. I mean, obviously there's some stuff, um, yeah, obviously that I can't really like talk about and stuff yeah. on like uh, prep and stuff. But I feel like this is kind of like my big fucking red flag. I mean, that's, that's something, at least that's a start, you know, coming into the next season, coming into the next split. But I think, yeah, I mean, uh, no, go ahead. I mean, I feel like it's just draft kind of philosophy because I don't yeah. know, like our, our style of drafting worked th this whole time. And then, uh, I don't know, you could say we were slow to adapt and stuff. And that is true. We were slow to adapt to the Zaya Ari thing. And I just feel like it's more, uh, in the end, it's more of a thing where you need to kind of put all your feelings or like beliefs aside and just be, try to be objective when mm -hmm. there's like two power picks like this coming out and be like, um, I don't know, also look at what's comfort for enemy than also than what's comfort for us because I don't know <laughs> we got what's our we got what was comfort for us and they got what was comfort for them and they just fucking stomped us. So mm, obviously yeah. it looks like you can't really tunnel on yourself anymore. You should look to <laughs> just uh, I don't know be more proactive in in like you know countering enemy comp. Yeah, which when, we, it sounds sounds really obvious, but yeah, I know when you're in such a fucking bubble and everything works for you, and it's something that it's so easy to overlook. I mean, and Kedra, maybe you can share insight on this too. But to me, it's like when when you're stubborn, when you're picking the same thing, and Fnatic are obviously the easiest example of this because they're first round. They got they admittedly got four LeBlanc games. They picked TF over and over into you guys again, despite the fact that like Larson was winning every mid lane matchup. They're getting murdered by Malorang in the jungle. Like, what is, is stubbornness just, like, it worked in scrims, I believe in the pick, let's run it back, it was just execution? Or is stubbornness, like, you don't actually have anything else prepared? You don't have an answer for this, you think this is your best answer? Like, where does the stubbornness come from? Is it the, like, I believe that it was just execution, let's run it back? Or does it come from, like, we don't actually have any more prepped in the draft department? Uh, it's, it's weird, isn't it? Because in a best of five, like, let's say you both come in with your meta reads and you lose game one are you really just going to take your last week or two of scrims and throw it out the window after one game on stage even though it's working in scrims i think that's very 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 hard to call it needs to be like a very decisive game or something needs to stand out a lot so then when you go into game two you stick to what you know and you're like well it must have just been a game one and then when you lose that game that's when i think the panic starts to set in you're like shit we are really we really fucked up here and that's when you go in game three and you just flip it and sometimes when you flip it, you see teams reverse sweep. And uh, when, you, when you do flip it, sometimes you see teams get 3-0'd because they're just playing something that they, they played earlier on in the split and it worked. Or they're just trying to do something that the enemy team's doing, but they'll never do it better because they're just better practice on it. Uh, so yeah, meta reads are pretty big, especially like the Ari Zaya thing. It's a niche one where, I mean, it's weird because I feel like Europe was also kind of slow to re react to this Ari Zaya thing. Uh, if you watch like... LCK and LPL a lot. Ari was already insanely high prior, even in the regular season. After the rework, it was being first picked by all the top three teams. Uh, and then there was glimpses of how broken Zaya was and like MF counters to it from KDF. Um, and then, yeah, that's just what the LCK meta was. I mean, Faker was playing Ari all the time. It was open and it was permabanned against him in the finals, I think. Um, so, yeah. Shit. And it's also kind of like a... A, a scrim thing because I, I don't know like I have some theories about like what happened to Fnatic and like I don't know a lot of times you go into scrims and you know you have these staple permabands on like red sides for example TF and then all of a sudden we have uh, Silas counter prepped versus it and then they're like uh, okay they probably permaband TF for the whole season on red side mm. and then on blue side they don't care because they feel like okay red side has to ban it and we just first pick it and then you end up to with to do like this question mark where you're like, well, what the fuck do we do now? Red side just left TF open, and then we picked it and we got stomped, and we're like, uh, yeah, but we never banned TF on blue side. And then, and then it's either that or they're not prepped to give TF on red side because they don't really have like a prep for it on on blue side. And then you end up on like down this rabbit hole, or it's like everyone's just out of comfort zone because it's just uh, that's whole structure you build in practice for like that week of of uh of play just goes away as well, you know? And I also felt like TF wasn't really the problem in the in the Fnatic series. I felt like more it was a, of a Thresh issue with, mm. um, like, Thresh is just kind of a bad champ. And 
from the from the looks of it, it, lo it really looked like Fnatic is speaking. I think it was like Jinx or Aphelios hype train. I forgot what it was. It was one yeah. of those two ADs. And they were instantly picking Thresh because for me it looked like they're just not comfortable to play those immobile ADCs without Thresh. Yeah, it's... it was kind of like uh, the thing from like last year or two years ago where it was just did this two combo, these two yeah. champions together. And it, it honestly felt like they stopped the TF marathon, they started banning it, but then they still pick, still pick Thresh and they still lost like two games in a row and Thresh was like 0 7 in the last seven games for them or something. Yeah. Mm. But no one looked at that. Everyone was just tunnel, vision, tunnel visioning on the TF. It's, it's what I like to call a Jarvan mind control. Where you first pick Aphelios, yeah. they want to Jarvan, and your whole your whole comms are like, ah, shit. Well, uh, we need to pick Thresh here, and I don't know who's saying it. If it's the coach saying we need to pick Thresh because they have Jarvan and we're playing Aphelios, if it's the AD carry saying he needs the Thresh to play the game, if it's Hilly saying he needs to pick Thresh, but like, yeah, it's the Jarvan mind control. Every single time you pick Jarvan, enemy AD is mind control to pick Esriel or have a Thresh on his team, and if he has one of those these two things, your bot lane needs to have a winning matchup, and the game is winnable. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I've been I've been in that situation. I've been the insider yeah. in that one, and it's it, it's it's kind of it's kind of funny to to witness it. Eighty carries, dude. I mm. I mean I've I swear, Riot ruined eighty carries the second they gave them a support and said you're special. You get an extra player just to make sure your job is good and that you do a good job. You get this whole extra human being just so that you can have a good time there, buddy. Pat on yeah. the back. Yeah. They're doomed. They're the inevitable. They can't. Determined by supports. Yep. No matter how humble and sweet they are, they're doomed to be ego monsters. It do be like that. <laughs> it do be like that. So what's the plan for Rogue? What's the plan, Odo? Um, I saw some LEC teams maybe going to bootcamp in Korea, maybe play against the MSI teams. Some are just taking a break. Do you have any idea what you're going to do in the offseason? Are you just going to chill? Uh, probably. I mean, I feel like... I, I don't know. I feel like taking this whole bootcamp is going to be be weird because like even if you do like a boot camp like msi is three weeks or so before lec so that means you're starting your season like one month before and i feel like it's gonna come bite you bite you in the ass a bit at some point during the the summer split um but at the same time it's also probably the teams that got knocked out earlier um they can kind of i mean honestly if you're already out for three weeks you're just fucking bored at home you kind of have nothing to do and uh, you don't mind starting earlier, you know, but uh, for me, it's like my season ended three days ago or four days ago, and for them, it ended like three weeks ago. So, mm -hmm. uh, I feel like it's it's a bit, it's a bit easier for them to uh, to do a boot camp and stuff. But honestly, for us, I think we just chill uh, at least maybe four weeks off or something like that, and then come end of May, I think that's when uh, we kind of start, I guess, at the same time as. Everyone, but I don't know if we're gonna do like boot camp or anything. We still didn't really have like uh, post finals debrief or whatever. We're still uh, taking like a week off or something, and then we're probably gonna talk about what happened and what we're gonna do. Yeah. Uh, for sample and stuff. Yeah. That's good. I'm glad you guys are actually taking time. I know that the, you inevitably will get bored and will want to get back to League of Legends. It happens to every pro that I have ever heard. <laughs> yeah. I heard you were playing yeah. Orin yesterday, and so look, you're already. Yeah, I saw you. I saw your stream, and um, yeah, I mean, I I saw you. I saw you get a, a great solo bolo. It it was crazy. Somehow yeah. the enemy set, uh, kind kind of yeah, mm, outplayed himself, and I was like, hmm. yeah, nah, I felt I felt inspired, you know. My Odo, baby. you're the biggest homie of all time. You have like free license to just absolutely light him up and roast him. Chat would follow you into the dark. They would like fucking jump off a cliff on the back of that roast right into the band hammer. But you're just like, nah, he got it. He did good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I am a master of PR answers. I am a, a master diplomat at work. <laughs> <laughs> got the subtle flame with the outplayed himself. You're, 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 I respect it, dude. Yeah. Um, side note, he's download just, Apex. He's just jealous of, Every my, uh, of my horn. Every sure. season, Odo, we talk about playing whatever BR is popular right now. I mean, Cajun were jamming some Apex Dude, last night. Apex, so download is Apex, so fucking fun. I've n I never played. One. I never played it because it was it came out during uh, the season, like 2019 or something. But now I'm playing it. It's so sick that game. I haven't played yeah. Apex in like I think four years maybe. I played it in like when it first came out, like the first year or the second year it came out, and then I just completely stopped. Yeah, we were supposed to play modern the the COD battle royale together, and we never got a chance because the season started up again. So if you want to play in your off season, and then you'll have an extra reason as to why things went wrong 
next split. You can be like, oh, the draft, or oh, Dracos and Cajun got me addicted to Apex. True, 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 true. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm probably gonna do that because I need I need another reason on my uh, whiteboard to to fuck it up next season. <laughs> Perfect. That's what we need. We need we need backups. We need excuses. Um, Odo, like last thing to talk about, I guess, is MSI predictions for G two. How do you feel about Europe? How do you feel about the LEC? Maybe you have. I assume you've looked at some of the competition, some of the teams that could be going toe to toe with them. So, what do you think? Are we in good hands, or is EU yeah. doomed? I'm not sure if uh, is LPL going to MSI. Still, I still have decided. I oh, have okay. no idea. So it's mostly I just T1, uh, G2 for like the yeah Finals, the big one. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I I don't know. Like honestly, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I'm gonna do the basic. I'm gonna do the typical thing and say, yeah, I don't think G2 was that great, but because uh, I feel like they just uh, when it's draft defy, it's it's really easy to stomp someone when you're just winning from draft. You can honestly mm. just break your break your hand and still win because. A is just unwinnable or like unlosable for draft, but at the same time, I feel like G2 kind of uh, not G2 T1 has kind of same style. I feel like I feel like their drafts and G2 drafts are kind of similar. More prior picks are kind of like similar, so I feel like uh, then it comes down to player diffy. And as much as I would like G2 to win, because honestly, they just fucking stomped us and they looked really good, you know. And I'm on the hype mm -hmm. train of them doing good internationally. I feel like. You, when you don't get draft if you against T1, it might be it might be a bit uh, a bit rough, you know, because I feel like I mean, objectively, a T1 should be better, you know, yeah. but um, I don't know. I feel like they don't have the ace in the sleeve like they had like they had against us because we're, we're just noobs, you know. It's it's easy <laughs> to do draft if you against noobs, but uh, T1 are not noobs, so um, I don't know. It's gonna be hard. Like uh, like I I really really want G2 to to do great at MSI, you know. I wanna. Uh, even though I'm a hater, and whenever I lose, I hate on everyone else who's winning, and I don't want anyone to win, and I don't want you to win. It would be it would be kind of lit for G2 to, to do well, and I would really want them to do well, just for like you know EU EU for the EU boys. But I don't know the fact that G that T1 is kind of like on the same meta. But honestly, since there's like two or three different patches, it, it, there might be some spice, you know. But I feel like they can do they can do they can do damage. Nice, I like it. Loose confidence. It's it's crazy. Well, yeah, you, confidence. Uh, Hope. What would you say is like the percentage decider of draft in a game? Like percentage. It, it, yeah. So like if if like one how team important has is a draft? Good draft? Is it eighty percent decided by draft? Is it seventy percent? The game. I would say sixty-five, seventy, maybe. Because I mean, obviously, you can win in unwinnable drafts uh, mm -hmm. if you just if you're just winning early game. You know, um, like uh, for example, it was what was it? Like our game against Fnatic, game one in finals, where enemy had Corky, Zaya, uh, Jace, and we had Nar, Lulu running around, and yeah. and Lee Sin. And it looks like honestly, when you look at 50 minutes in game, you look at our champions and you say five useless champions, and enemy has five good champs, and then yeah. you can still kind of like win off of like something random. But I feel like I I would say the thing with draft is not that like it's unwinnable. It's just your conditions to win are just so much narrower than enemy team. Mm -hmm. it, it, like, I need to do one good play out of... Like, I need to do, like, not one good play. Like, maybe 10 out of 100 plays are good for me, while for enemy is 90 out of 100 plays are good for him. Mm -hmm. So it's so much easier for the team with good draft to win. But, like, yeah, obviously, if you find a niche situation, you can maybe win. Or, like, you can win, because mm -hmm. obviously there's good plays everywhere. They're just, like, it's hard to make them happen. But I don't know. I would say if if there's, like... If it's draft, if you would say maybe it's like 65, 70 percent. Interesting. Dang. Dang. That's cool. It's something approaches. worth tracking too. Uh, Odo, here's my question. Here's the the actual last last question. Um, top of the table in LEC. Obviously, a lot will change spring to summer. But yep. are we? You kind of accredited G 2s win on the day mostly to the to the the confidence in draft. Is should we expect like? top of the table let's say for now you fanatic and g2 are you guys fighting neck and neck or is this g2 team actually like a step above everyone else or is it in your eyes is it really just the difference in draft not the difference in like let's say player or team structure or environment or anything else that um allowed them to win so convincingly in the final week of playoffs mm, i mean i feel they had a lot of good things going for them i, I don't know i wouldn't want to say that uh uh, yeah, it was just draft defy, and if it wasn't draft defy, we would have won, you know, because I feel like that's just kind of 
that's kind of like a lame thing for me to say or or sure. like do um i don't know I, at the same time like i looked at like our roster we were kind of like big big underdogs in kind of everything at the beginning of the season mm-hmm. and I, I feel like i would say we're kind of like in the same position as at the beginning of the season we're still kind of like an underdog and i feel like the reason we played so well the split was that everyone just did this job and everyone just try hard it's super hard and um and and whatnot because i mean on paper i still feel like our team is maybe not not the best you mm-hmm. know it's just like people mm-hmm. were just uh playing well together and everyone's just really really doing his job really well and i'm happy for like everyone from my team for doing that um but i don't know it's, it's, it's like one of those things where i feel like if we stop doing the things that uh or like practice the way we practice this this uh, split we could go down it could go downhill you know um because mm-hmm. uh you don't have the uh, vitality super team hopium buff that vitality has for example because i feel like going to next split you guys are probably going to be like mm, yeah i mean they had a split where they fixed some of their problems um yeah vitality top four again uh you know uh, <laughs> we don't have that going for us you think that's what i took away from this season is that like oh yeah clearly everything's gonna be fine you think you think no that's way. the narrative we're gonna <laughs> no draw but, but, you, but you guys are you guys are gonna spin it and flip it in a way where it's gonna sound like that uh, at the final product after like months of like shaping it's gonna be something like that it's probably gonna be something sure. like yeah um yeah they have the x factor yeah perks uh uh, one two comfort zone that's that's co- probably gonna come up at least twice or something um yeah and you guys are gonna find stuff like this just to kind of like hype <laughs> oh, it up you know yeah but oda we also do the same shit for your team bro we were like no one saw this rogue team coming do you know how many times i had to say that like at least once per rogue game i was like remember at the start of the season when none of us thought rogue was gonna be that good look at They're them now top like, two in regular it's season the job bro i don't know what you want from me we just have to tell a story about how we a team got to where they got every team. first they sucked then team. they were good that would be the vitality story if they end up being good we can't, it's not like propaganda you make it sound like we're just out here fucking making shit up <laughs> no but it's just it's just, it's just funny because because I, I know i know your your guys thought process that's why i'm i'm, I'm laughing so much but i mean, you know you we guys gotta are... get people to be interested in the games you know if we just yeah. chat on every team everyone be like Nah, yeah. no, I'm good. <laughs> Look how yeah. far they've come. They still suck, but they are in top four no, now. Top viewer, three. Ladies and gentlemen, this game narrative. is going to be shit, but we promise <laughs> it'll be enjoyably shit. There you go. <laughs> no, I mean you guys are legit. So, um, I I don't know. Like I uh, I I feel like I'm not so sure that like G2 is going to be like you know uncontestably the best. But uh, since they're their champs, they're obviously going to ride on the buff for a while. Uh, yeah. going to summer uh, but I don't know I feel like come mid of summer split or towards the end I still feel like it's maybe going to be similar to what we had right now in top 4 maybe Misfits is going to like drop off a cliff probably because uh, yeah it, it didn't look like too too great Um, Excel honestly is, I feel like it's maybe one of those things that is going to come back better I, I would say in summer because uh, I mean it, it looks sad the way they lost but I feel like uh, compared to previous years or compared to the beginning of the split, they've been kind of like ramping it up. Mm. So I don't know. I would say it's kind of like similar with G2, Rogue, Fnatic. Um, I have no idea what, what to think about Mad Lions. If the roster is the same, it might still just stay where it is because it didn't look like super great. Um, I know it's hard because I feel like the standout is just like us three with, I, I don't know, maybe like Excel and. Uh, yeah. So it might just be I, another year of G2 Rogue Fennec? I mean, it, it looks like it, unless there's like big changes coming through, because it's like, the, it, I feel like outside of Excel, nothing really happened to kind of justify putting hype on anyone kind of like jumping on the on the train, you know, on the playoffs train, or like the top four train. Because um, mm. there were no like real big standouts, because... Yeah, you can always make the argument of vitality like we memed earlier that um maybe something happens and you know traditionally players are good individually blah 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 maybe they make it work in a team blah 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 and they're like uh, our good top four and all of this stuff you know but outside of this and excel i feel like there's been no clear standouts unless i'm missing someone 
Because, yeah, I mean, there used to be Misfits, and I would have liked Misfits because, like, Misfits is kind of like the always the fun dark horse of LEC that they always end mm -hmm. up on the top with, you know, odds stacked against them. Odo knows all the narratives. Cool. Yeah, it's it's great it's great narrative. I mean, it's it's banger narrative. But uh, outside of that, I, I honestly don't know who is who can join on the even like have a great narrative around them to go into like the middle of like summer split or whatever. Oh, oh no, all I'll say, dude, is that if you ever retire, I'm looking forward to playing these clips back to you years from now when you're <laughs> the guy going misfits, the dark horse of the LEC, like never the team we expect. Yep. When you've got yep. the suit on and you're paid to say it, because <laughs> you're ready. You know all the words, you know all the moves to the dance. I'm just ready to see you do. Bro, the dance, I, I, I lived through the dark times of the EU cast where it was literally narrative machine it was literally you're going on the on the ferris wheel of narratives or, and you would just like see what it stops and be like oh this is the one we're saying this game <laughs> was it, when was that uh what was it like maybe four years ago four years ago there it used to be dark times 2018 yeah. maybe yeah there was a time where oh, i mean no cap there was a time where all of you fuckers were being muted by me because i could not stand the narratives you guys were burger flipping every single game and honestly, for two years, I stopped muting you guys because you guys are actually slaying it. But um, there used to be dark Holy times. Odo comes in here based as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking fearless, bro. I respect it. Uh, Damn. No, but oh, you guys are smurfing my... now. You guys are, you guys are, you guys are smurfing now. Now, yeah, now, if I watch yeah. it without the cast, I don't enjoy myself, you know. Oh. Damn. Well, Damn. The right there. The oh, how can we not love you, Odo? You're such a good. You're such a good, good guest. You're the homie. Um. Sick, dude. I think we'll let you go then. You know, enjoy your break. Yeah, it enjoy was it me. was nice. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, I dude, went out of my dep dep depression bubble for a second, and now I'm gonna jump back in. <laughs> oh my okay. god, sounds, <laughs> sounds good, man. Well, when you're in the bubble, you know, if, uh, are you in are you in Berlin? Or are you heading home? Home? No, I'm already home for like uh, two or three days. Well, well if you want to play Apex, you out of your bubble. Up. Yeah, if you want to play Apex, we can online. Yeah, I'm probably gonna play bubble. Apex with you guys. Although I warn you, I'm. Cadrill like went from trash in our first game to cracked by the end of like our sixth or seventh game. I suck. Shit, so I might send you further into the bubble when you play. I mean, I I, I, I'm right shit you will go shooters. deeper into the bubble. We get some chicken dinners. We get some chicken dinners. <laughs> I'm shit at yeah, shooters. Yeah. I'm like fucking gold or silver in CS. So we're probably we're probably buddies. Ah, oh, sick. Yeah, we'll just we'll run it together. Yeah, we're just gonna sit behind Cadrill and let him do all the work. Don't yeah, do that. Exactly. Don't do that. I'll agree. Just like Excel 2018. <laughs> you mean 2019? 19. Whatever. Whenever yeah, you yeah, yeah. I can't Good keep track. Anymore. Good times. <laughs> that one. They didn't exist in 2018. Oh, man. No, I don't uh, know. I suck at FPS, but Apex is fun. Feels like Halo. Good shit. I feel like All we're right. always advertising games that aren't League of Legends. Anyway. Thanks, yeah. Odo. Uh, thanks home. for having me, guys. Have a have a enjoy your scuffed Fioria. Yeah. Scuffed um, Yeah. Yeah. See right. you guys later. Peace out, bro. Bye. Bye. And instantly all the cameras break. All yep. the positioning breaks. Um, damn, good to talk to Odo. Shout out to Odo. Uh, I know a lot of you guys remember that the takeaway there, because I did ask some questions that maybe put Odo in a weird position. It, the takeaway there is not that G2 won 100% because of draft, or that G2 didn't deserve to win, or that Rogue would have just won automatically if their draft was better. I know you chatters like to just throw out hyperbole. And it's like 50-50 if you fuckers believe the shit that you're saying. But I don't want to see they these. They love like... drama. They love the clips. They love the shit talk. They love the chatting. Odo based. Wow, Odo based. But then you're also, some of you are the same people who will then go click. Odo just typed that he doesn't even believe that G2 is a good team. Blah, 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 blah. Like, you guys are also like, as someone who makes narratives, like, guys, come on. That's that's a shit narrative. The only so, karma like, these people know is the much. karma on Reddit, not League of Legends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm untouchable. An anonymity puts me above the law. Yeah. I, I, I'm not responsible for the words that come out of my mouth. <laughs> Clipped and shipped. Drama um, enjoyer. Lips from base. Shut the fuck up. All right, that's, that we'll was... Do AMA? Should we do... I don't know. How do you want to end? Because I know you also have a top lane to get to. No, you have no some I'm going to end the stream hardcore. Like or... Yeah, I'm gonna host oh, my boy Daniel Dracos casts on. His oh Elden my Ring. God, no, bro. Okay, I wasn't on this Elden Ring, on this Elden Ring uh, run. Oh shit, I should probably. We can. Be... You can start to stream on another. Um, guys, any questions? Anything you want to talk about? Anything quickly before we um. Before we call it a day. 
MVP of the week, uh, Caps. That wasn't even a hard one. Actually, oh, yeah, no, MVP as much capped. as Caps was smurfing, like, shout out to Yankos, Bro, my man was insane. Shout out to Yankos. Targumus did good. Shout out to Broken Blade. Cr insane development for Broken Blade. Big shout out to Broken Blade. Dude is so wholesome. Dude is so cool. Yeah. I've turned on my stream and it's just my webcam and no one's going to have any idea what's going also, on. Also, um, I forgot. Oh, yeah, roster leaks. So Wulu did a tweet. There's rumors of VTO being sold from Misfits or leaving Misfits to go to Mad or XL. So it sounds like Mad and XL are trying to change their mid laners. Astralis is making some changes. That's all we know so far. Um, I don't know what Misfits are going to do without VTO. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, but yeah, that's the only roster change we know so far. I think during MSI and after MSI we'll know more. Um, a lot of people also asking about tracking the pros. Yeah, we'll do tracking the pros when, um, when all the players in Korea. Right now it's only the Korean players and the LPL players that are there right now, of course. Um, oh yeah, do you want to... Actually, I'll talk to you about soft stream. I was going to say we could do a little... Do a little thing. Do a little co-streamy thing at some point. I could join what you. What is your Twitch? About... It's Dracos Casts. It's Dracos Casts. Dracos Casts. Regardless, chat you return shit. poggers. All right. That was uh, Scuffed Foria episode something. Me Whatever. and Dracos. Scuffed, scuffed. Scuffed, scuffed. Uh, I'm not going to stream today. I'm going to take a break. But Dracos is streaming. So we're all going to go raid Dracos because he's going to do his Elden Ring run through. It's his first Thank stream you. in how long? Thank you, homie. Like, literal years. First stream in I years. I think the last time I streamed was when Legends of Runeterra came out. Keck Damn. W. All right. Well, everyone go to Dracos's chat. Spam some Kade raids. Give him some love. Um, thanks for being my co-host, bro. No problem, my dude. Thank That's you for... Time. Love you too, bro. Shout out to, shout out to the chat. Uh, we'll be back maybe for... I don't know if we're doing Dive for you yet. We'll figure it out. But regardless, yeah. tune in from here on this channel, as always, for more sign gameplay. And reminder, I, I don't have a sub button. So if you're like, wow, I would love to support Dracos, you know how you can support me? By supporting my boy who is supporting me, Cadrill, right here with those Twitch primers before we Bruh. go. Because you can't give them to me, so give them to Mark. And it's like you're giving them to me because Mark is giving me the gift of your initial viewership. So Pogo, Pogo, Pogo. We're all given. Everyone's given. It's a big given circle. Pogo, Pogo. All right. Sending the boys over now. Enjoy your stream, buddy.